changed here at Stanford in 1960. The second one was in Jerusalem in 1964. And I gave a talk, and then after my talk, Pat came and asked whether I wanted to come to Stanford. <laughs> I said that we had just decided to go to Norway and live there. And he said, he said I knew that, but still, if I wanted to come a part of the time, I did not come. And of course, that was what enabled us to stay in Norway, because Norwegian incomes were far too small for support of a big family. <coughs> but in any case, uh, I, I assume that Pat had consulted his colleagues before he came here to talk. We have heard here several stories about how he told somebody you're hired. <laughs> but uh, I think that I owe also gratitude to the colleagues of his, and many of them are here. David Nivison, to start with the oldest one, sits here and is almost as old as Pat, half a year younger. And then we have Saul Pfefferman, who was also here and must have been in on the decision. And we have Dana Scott. And uh, we have uh, people who are not here now, but uh, who are still alive, or Kreisel is still alive. And he was here. Yes, he's a in Salzburg. Is, Kreisel is living in Salzburg. Yes, so that's right. He lives in Salzburg and I gave lectures in Salzburg last year. And Kreisel actually came to the lectures, which was very nice. So he's, uh, he's uh, still at least able to listen. I don't know whether I've not seen anything that he's writing yet. But in any case, uh, I have then enjoyed very much being together with Pat for all these years. And we have been teaching seminars together on all kinds of topics. I think we have taught more than one dozen seminars together on topics ranging from parts of philosophy of science, freedom, medieval philosophy, into subjectivity, and uh, even perspective in the arts. So there's a wide range of topics that all are topics that gets very much engaged by. And uh, I think this is what is so typical of Pat, that he gets engaged by so many topics. And actually, even when he came to Stanford originally in 48, he was immediately made a professor also of statistics <coughs> and economics. How did you get on? Hmm? Just statistics. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, statistics, yes. but education yeah. came yeah. early. But one strange thing is that in 1948, Pat got a prize for the best work in the world in psychology that year. Yeah, yeah. Hmm? A little later than 48. A little later than 48. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah that. But in any case, at the time that he got it, <laughs> he was not a member of the psychology department. <laughs> He was, and that prize went to philosophy. And the psychology department, of course, immediately acted by making him a member of the <laughs> so, But what uh, is so striking about Pat is that he gets so enthusiastic about the things that he's working on. He's very interested. He asks all kinds of questions. There's a lot of curiosity in Pat. And he's always very open. He listens to views. In the, likes listening to views different from his own. And uh, this openness, of course, means that he gets this very broad field of work. It stimulates people who are with him. But it is combined with a critical power. One of the most common questions you hear from Pat is, what is the evidence? <laughs> and I, think, I think that combination of openness, but at the same time, a critical attitude to we talk about is a very, very typical characteristic of Pat. And of course, he has now written and worked on so many different fields. And although I had so much to do with him over the years, I must admit that, of course, I have read only a very, very small part of all that Pat has written. And uh, really, a very sad admission is that I have not even read Pat's bibliography. I never had time to do that. <laughs> But now, fortunately, it's out electronically. And Pat has been very good at organizing his bibliography so that you find it by field. 
So then I was now going to look at everything else then in the philosophy of language. I could just concentrate on that part of his bibliography because I think there are about 500 articles and about 50 books plus a lot of books that he has edited. Maybe the number is higher now. It's a few weeks since I checked. <laughs> but in any case, uh, it's very, very impressive with all this activity over such a broad field. Now, when it comes to what I'm going to talk about, uh, his uh, contribution to the philosophy of language, I did give a talk on this topic when you were 70, <laughs> 20 years ago. Then I did not say main. <laughs> <laughs> But that was because uh, I had more time <laughs> and more minutes. And also because I think that uh, there has been much more happening during those 20 years. So it's not impossible really to cover the whole thing. But I will uh, distinguish five different areas of your work. Actually, you published a book 20 years ago, which then you suggest that there are four main areas of your work in the philosophy of language, but one more area has been added after that book. The first one was there, psychology of language, especially children's acquisition of language. Second work of a formal linguistic kind, including work on variable three semantics, language and robots. And then uh, language and the brain, that was not even mentioned in that book 20 years ago. That's where you have done a good deal of work lately. And uh, we have heard already about that from Colin Crangle and Marcus Pereira Gill. And then uh, what I really wanted to concentrate is this fifth area of meaning, because there you have done a lot of interesting work. And uh, that's also very close to my own interests. Uh, these other things. Uh, I should mention that especially when it comes to, to the children's language, there you actually have re registered a lot. We have just heard about all these diaries of children's linguistic development. And Pat actually carried out detailed studies where you're partly bringing children into experimental situations, but partly also just following what is going on in the children's use of language in very natural situations in their own lives. So there's a very lot of data, as you heard earlier too, Pat emphasizes the use of data, really not just giving loose theories, but checking those theories with data. So these are, this is a very important and interesting field, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the notion of meaning. And here, a very recent article, 2007, there, Pat distinguishes three, three kinds of meaning. One is meaning given by formal definition, and that's relatively unproblematic. It, of course, raises some very interesting logical problems, and there are problems. One of the first talks I ever gave after I finished my studies was on this problem of indefinability. There are certain things that simply cannot be defined in a certain system. <coughs> These are pretty logical problems. And, uh, Pat has done some of that, but uh, he's not really concentrating so much on that. He also has done a little bit on dictionary meaning. But uh, the third area is what he has been working the most long, and that is meaning as associations. These are the three kinds that he distinguishes in that article from 2007. And it's meaning as association that you should take a look at. And that is that we have lots of associations connected with a word. And if you look in a dictionary, then maybe just one or very few features are mentioned. But I agree with, with uh, Pat that uh, we should really look at meaning much more the way we look at an encyclopedia. There's a lot of information connected with the notion. For example, horse, or perhaps examples, chair. It's not just one or a few features, but there's a lot of them. And I think that is also something that uh, <coughs> was emphasized by Quine. One way of putting his opposition to the analytic synthetic distinction was by saying that uh, I don't distinguish dictionaries and encyclopedias. I think that all these associations that are connected to the word are really very much on a the par. There's no line to be drawn between some that are analytic 